But before we get started, I just want to pray once more and ask God to be with us this morning. Lord Jesus, we are uh, humbled by your gospel. Lord, we are just, I'm just grateful to be here this morning um, in the presence of your people with a purpose, a single purpose to worship and love. Lord, I pray your gospel would be clear this morning. I pray your, pray your word and truth would penetrate. Um, I pray that everything we read, everything we say, everything we think um, would be true and honoring to you. Father, help us learn, help us love, and just help us be humble. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I think a, <clears throat> a staple value um, today in our culture is forging your own path, creating your own way, defining yourself and for yourself what it is you want or need in life. In career or work, for thousands of years, uh, your, your job would be defined by what your father did or your mother did. If your father was a butcher, you'd be a butcher. If your father was a baker, you'd become a baker. You'd learn the trade. But now we choose for ourselves what purpose we give ourselves in our careers. Or we go to college and we put off that decision. Or like myself, you go to college and make that decision several times over. <laughs> but this virtue of self-definition, as with much of Western culture, has crept its way into Western evangelicalism and in into Christianity. There is this tendency and this need to elevate ourselves, our desires, and our wants above God's purposes, desires, and wants. Who we want to be is more important to us than who God wants us to be. Oftentimes, uh, the purpose that we define for ourselves is elevated above the purpose that God has given us in his word. This morning in Psalm 2, God is, David is going to talk about rebellion and submission. On one hand, the rebellion to the rule and reign of God, and on the other, submission to the lordship and friendship of Jesus. And sometimes in our culture, as a Christian, you can get caught in the middle. It can feel like we're caught in the middle. A culture that demands we forge our own path, divine for ourselves who we want to be, what is good, what is right. And on the other, submission to a God that created humanity with a purpose, a specific purpose, to be distinct, to submit to his rule. And amidst this struggle today, we're going to see this in Psalm 2. David's going to give us this beautiful, simple truth Jesus is our refuge. In the storm of a culture bent on rebellion and a God of justice and wrath, there is one refuge and it's Jesus. And inside the psalm, we're gonna see it broken into two halves. The first half is the vanity of rebellion and the second half is the blessing of submission to God. And those two halves are actually broken off into two halves themselves. Uh, the psalm has four movements. The first two are the, the vanity of rebellion and the second two are the blessing of submission. And so for the first, first half of the psalm, we see the vanity of rebellion. Read with me Psalm 2, verses 1 through 6. David says this, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So there are two things happening here, two movements, right? Each has its own focus. And the first three verses is the first movement. David points out that there is a people that have risen up against God's people in opposition to God. And in the second movement, we see God's response to that rebellion. So starting with the first three verses, we see the nation's rage in the first movement. And what we see here is some kind of unified coalition against God and his people. The psalm was written by King David. Um, it's not titled in psalm like many are, but in Acts 4, Luke attributes this psalm to David. And the people of Israel, they have a complicated place in history in the ancient world of the Old Testament. And many times they've been under nations, subjected to them in rule. And at others, they've been a sovereign nation, independent, ruled by kings, anointed by God. And this psalm that David writes arrives at a moment of independence as David laments the rise of this international coalition of monarchies bent on the destruction of God's people and the worship of the God of Abraham. See, all throughout the Old Testament, there's this conflict between Israel and the nations around them. Something kind of interesting here in this verse, 
is we see unity in the distaste for God and Israel. In verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. These nations that themselves worship different gods have different desires and goals and aims together have come in opposition to God and to the nation of Israel. They've unified with a singular purpose. And unity, it's an interesting concept today. Um, It's hard to agree on things. It's hard to get people to unify. Look at politics, two sides that can barely talk without arguing or even violence. Sports, no one can agree who the best basketball player ever is. No one can ever get it right that it's LeBron. (laughs) We live in Missoula. We live in Missoula. If you have something nice to say about MSU, you're not really a Missoulian. I think an awesome example of what's happening here in Psalm 2 is actually in soccer. There's this thing in soccer, international soccer, it's called hooliganism. Basically, it's sports fanaticism, fanaticism taken to the extreme. And we have it in, in, in the United States, but soccer is like a religion in many countries. And in the last century, there have been what is called hooliganism, specifically in English soccer and other countries. I don't want to single out England, but it's kind of where hooliganism began. And basically, it's, it's when one group of fans, fanatics, and another group of fans clash over their support for the team. And it's not like clashing, like arguing about LeBron versus Jordan. It's like violence, like violent clashing in the stands, in bars, and in pubs. There have been many instances. We've seen it in our country as well with other sports. And now if you dropped into one of those moments, it'd be really far-fetched to see these two groups of people getting along or having a unity and purpose. And yet, as the World Cup rolls around, both groups of fans would stand arm in arm, hugging and cheering on the nation, facing other nations. There's a greater purpose, a greater unity at stake. Something greater than their allegiance to their local neighborhood is their allegiance to their country. That's what's happening here in Psalm 2. These nations hated God so much, they hated Israel and the God of Abraham so much that they put, it was a larger issue for them to have unity over than the squabbles that they had amongst themselves. They set aside their own violent disagreements about religion, politics, and culture that they might annihilate the God of Abraham. But it's not just they want to annihilate God or Israel. Look at verse 3. It says, at the end of verse 2, his anoint, they, they say, this is the, the nation speaking, let us burst apart or burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. They want to separate the nation of Israel from the God of Israel. This unified coalition hates God so much that they aren't interested only in destroying the nation of Israel. Rather, they want to separate Israel from God. They want to break the bond, cast away the cords, the cords that bind this relationship between God and his people. They want to sever the connection between Israel and God. This is why you see King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel outlaw worship and prayer to the God of Israel. He is the true king, Nebuchadnezzar. He is the only one that can be prayed to and worshiped to, not God. I think it's hard for us to identify with this, like the violence of this experience that David and Israel are amidst. But I don't think it's hard for us to identify and identify with the spirit of it. A culture that rejects the idea of a, a single God in rule over everything a culture that wants you to leave your faith at the door when you enter a public school, a voting booth, or a college class. A culture that rejects biblical morality and instead through pop culture and entertainment celebrates the abandonment of morality. A culture that rejects not only the truth of God's word, but the very idea of objective truth altogether. The separation of church and state didn't originate with a Supreme Court decision nor is rejection of a transcendent, all-powerful God the unique product of postmodernism. The separation of God from his people has been an active and often violent mission of sinners since the fall of man. Rebellion against God, against his people, and his word is not a new thing. It isn't an old thing, it's a thing. (laughs) An ever-present reality this side of eternity.
Now, as depressing as my tone may be right now, (laughs) did you notice David's tone at the beginning? Read with me again Psalm 1. A question. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Vanity. He calls this coalition of unified rebels vain. The struggle against separating Israel from their God, it's vanity. Certain countries, China's commitment to removing Christianity from its people. Academia's struggle to keep faith and religion at the door. It's vanity. It's all vanity. Which leads us into the second movement of this section of Psalm. And David tells us why it's vanity. We see God's faithful rule. Look at what David says as he begins the second movement of Psalm 2 in verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. There can be this like idea in, in, in Western evangelicalism that God is love and only love. A cuddly, warm, inoffensive view of God that only chooses to see and focus on a God that accepts all people, no matter their past, no matter their path in life. God is here for you. It doesn't matter what you've done or even what you will do. Jesus loves you. And that goes hand in glove with that idea of self-definition. I can be who I want to be. I define what is good and right, and God will accept me no matter what. The truth is, is God is love. God is merciful and forgiving and kind. If you repent, if you turn from the unified rebellion that you are participating in and humbly fall on your knees before the cross of Jesus. But if not, what does he say? He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. It's really important that as Christians, we focus on the redemptive work of Jesus, that we focus on grace and mercy and forgiveness, But grace, mercy, and forgiveness are only necessary in light of God's wrath against sin and rebellion and evil. To diminish the wrath of God is to diminish the grace of God. To diminish sin and to diminish sin and transgressions is to diminish the significance and magnificence of forgiveness. See, God is still God. Whether these nations rise against him or accept him. That is why David paints this picture of God's laughter, because God is above it all. No matter how big these nations think they can be, no matter how highly they can build a tower, no matter how great anyone can grow in the eyes of the world, there is one God, one creator, one who sits on a throne above it all with infinite power and perfect rule. Blissful ignorance, obstinate rebellion, or humble submission, God is still God. And the beautiful thing about that God is that he is faithful and merciful. Look at verse five and six again. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, this is God speaking, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God is faithful to uphold his people with an anointed king. And in this moment, in Israel's history, it's against overwhelming odds. In the face of stronger armies, larger armies, more vicious and violent people, God has set his king, his anointed, and he will not be moved. David's confidence, his unshakable reliance on God, a reliance that makes sense. See, faith isn't blind, it isn't, it isn't baseless. God and Israel have this history of God always and continually delivering his people despite the fact that they would rebel and reject him. Several times God would make covenants with his people. He would promise to protect them and make them flourish and they would promise and commit to worshiping him and loving him only as God. And time and time again, from generation to generation, Israel would fail at their commitment. God's people would break their covenant And the inevitable result would be conquest and subjugation. And yet time and time again, God would redeem them and rescue them and restore them. See, the nature of these covenants that God makes, it's it's two-way. It's two-way covenant. As soon as it's broken on one end, it ceases to bind the other. And so it was not an obligation that God would deliver his people over and over again. 
that he would set a king and defend his people. It was not a self-bound pact or agreement. It was God's mercy and faithfulness. Despite the rebellion, he was gracious and merciful to his people. He is who he says he is, and he, do, he does what he says he will do. Faith is not blind. David's confidence here is not baseless. God is faithful in his rule. So as we arrive at the second half of Psalm 2, David has established this vanity in rejecting God and rising up against the Lord of, of Israel. We see the second half. It's the blessing of submission. Where the ser- first half of this song was the futility of raging and warring against the rule and reign of God, this half is the beautiful reality of bringing oneself into submission to the Lord with joy and obedience. And in this first half, the movement, the third movement, we see something beautiful. We see a better king, something even David would see. Let's look at Psalm 2, verse 7 through 12. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned. O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Again, two movements in the first half. We see this decree by God. In the second, we see a response by the people. These verses have a significant place, verses uh, 7 through 9. They have a significant place in God's word. Uh, These verses are quoted numerous times in the New Testament. Actually, um, it's one of the Psalms that's quoted most in the New Testament is Psalm 2. And David saw beyond his historical circumstances of this, this rebellion, and he saw something greater. One thing that's really helpful for us as we read God's word, specifically in the Old Testament, is that we read it with a redemptive lens. And that is reading God's word, and specifically the Old Testament, with this view of the gospel of Jesus as the backdrop for everything we read, everything in history. And because so much of the Old Testament contains these conflicts and wars and skirmishes, all of which represent something bigger, a larger conflict, an even larger redemption, If we don't hold the cross in view as we read this, some texts like this can read like a cheesy action movie rather than a history of redemption and grace. Whether it's Psalms or Proverbs or First and Second Kings, all of it points forward to the Gospels and to the work of Jesus. All of the proof we need of that is the simple fact that Psalm 2 is one of the most quoted Psalms in the New Testament. With that in mind, look at what is happening here historically. David and Israel are going to crush their enemies by the hand of God. Verse 7 through 9, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. God is going to in this moment, deliver historical and political victory over their enemies. They're going to break their enemies with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel, all presumably against the odds. I mean, we love these underdog stories, don't we? The story of Israel is often underdogs. David's established their current predicament. Many nations against one, bent on their destruction. Israel's a small nation, a nation that's been enslaved, a nation that didn't have a home, didn't have a land of their own, an underdog. And God tells them that they will have decisive victory over a stronger, more populated, more brutal enemy. God is decreed and David believes it. But as we read this and try and see it through the cross, what can we see as 21st century believers? Well, as we see, these are the most quoted one of the most quoted texts in the New Testament. The clear commentary of God's own word in the New Testament tells us that these very verses point to something far more than the anointing of a king 
over Israel to deliver them from their enemies several thousand years ago. That's a really good thing. (laughs) Because as God's people have established over and over and again, they aren't exactly the most faithful group. Actually, the next five Psalms, verse Psalms three through seven, is David lamenting his own failures, his own weaknesses, his own sin, the sin of his people against God, how they are unfaithful, how they continue to be unfaithful before God, and yet how wonderful and glorious and merciful God is. And so as the New Testament gets to this idea of kingship, in Psalm 2, a better king is offered. Look at Acts, verse 13, chapter 13, verses 32 and 33. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Look at Hebrews 1, verse 5. First half of verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, talking, he's talking about Jesus, how Jesus is greater than the angels, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. See, Jesus is the true and better David, the true and better king, the better anointed king over God's people. Even for David, there was something greater here than just victory over these enemies. There is an anointed king that would never fail as he gets to Psalm 3 through 7 and laments the weaknesses of Israel and himself. He sees something more beautiful, and that's a better king. See, it could be, I think it could be really, really hard for us as we read texts like this um, to really feel what David felt. I think there are a lot of Christians that can, just not here. There's brothers and sisters in North Korea, Christian brothers and sisters in Iran, the Middle East, China, and Africa. In 2021, actually, so far, the most Christians killed specifically for their faith have been in Africa. Living in those countries, they could probably feel this text. It's not hard to empathize with this text for them when your government will literally kill you or imprison you for worshiping Jesus publicly, for attending or starting a church service, or for sharing that faith with anyone around you. But what about us? In this room, all of our privileges and comforts, getting weird looks from a coworker in the break room because you're praying over your lunch, some awkward conversations with those coworkers about faith, the fear of what Your professor will think if you reveal that you actually believe a God created the universe. And to be fair, there is some institutional stresses on our faith. There are spaces where you cannot share your faith in in, in a workplace. Sometimes we risk social capital to talk about a biblical morality. But hold that reality and the reality of David, Christians in North Korea and Africa, side by side, it's incomparable. It's hard for us to get it. And I think that's in part due to misplacing ourselves when we read this psalm. We want to be the protagonist. We want to be the main character. We want to be David or even Israel. I'm cool being Israel. God's people up against God's enemies. That may be true. But we miss a crucial part of our experience if that's all we're thinking about. We were actually, every single one of us, at one time or now, on the other side of the battlefield. We were the unified rebels. Standing against God. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us, verse 8 through 10, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? You and I 
are or were the enemies of God. You and I were unified in our mutual distaste for submission to the God of the Bible. For every Christian in here, we all have a story, a testimony of our life before Jesus, an experience of redemption, where we transition from the enemy of God to the people of God. And like the enemies of God being shattered and broken, my own story is one of being shattered and broken, shattered into pieces. Mine is one of sin and shame, rejection of a God that might care. A man left broken before a worthless life littered around me the remnants of false hopes, pretend refuges, and empty promises. The way for you and I to feel this psalm isn't to try and walk in the shoes of David or a Christian in North Korea. It's to walk in our own shoes, to see the painful and yet wonderful reality that I was an enemy of God and yet now am adopted by God himself, a co-heir with King Jesus of the promise. You and I no longer need fear the wrath of God, the fury of his justice, the iron rod of his righteousness, because though we were broken and shattered, we have been put back together with a renewed and greater purpose. And with that, we might respond in worship like we ought. Where David leads into the final movement of the psalm, we see our submission and our refuge. He gives us a picture of what it means to submit and to worship Jesus as rebuilt vessels. Verse 10, now therefore, O king, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. No longer do I fear the wrath of God, but I can serve the Lord with awe and rejoice with trembling. A holy kiss to Jesus who won't, that won't be rejected, but welcomed with open arms and friendship and love. Fellow heirs of the same promise made to David and the rest of God's people. I no longer fear the judgment and the wrath and the fury of God because Jesus took it all. Because blessed are those who take refuge in him him who endured, him who secured, him who was begotten, him who was crucified, on whom the wrath of God was poured out. Jesus is the protagonist of this story. Not you and I, not Israel, not even David. Jesus is the protagonist. I think this changes a lot how we see our enemies, his enemies. If we recognize our experience as once the enemies of God, how much more empathy and how much more love and care could that inspire as we look at those who reject God? At the coworker who doesn't know what to say, the classmate who wants to argue, or the family member that refuses to engage over faith and religion. It changes it. No longer are they others because that was just you and me apart from the miraculous work of the Spirit of God on our souls. How different might our interactions and our relationships be if we stop thinking about them as them and think about them as us apart from the grace of God? And yet the truth is the enemies of God have much to fear. The enemies of David had much to fear. They willfully reject a God that would constrain them, that would demand submission. They'd rather worship the gods of their own making that would free them, free them from the shackles of submission. Gods of war, of violence, of conflict, gods of fertility, of passion, of sex, of intimacy, gods of wealth and prosperity and plenty, gods that let them determine for themselves what was to be. So to those that stand opposed, maybe in this room, proudly standing against the tide of Christianity and religion of some ruler in the sky, you are not unique. As unpolitically correct as that is to say, you are not unique. 
you stand numbered with the millions, the billions of people throughout history that have rejected, opposed, and warred against the God of the universe that would demand your submission. David calls it a vain struggle. For you, it is appropriate to fear the wrath of God, the justice and judgment of a perfect king. Consider that you might be wrong. What then? Because I suspect that for most that reject and stand opposed to God, it wasn't because there was a lack of evidence. It wasn't because there was a lack of a good argument. It's because it was submission. Submission to someone other than themselves. You cherish the freedom of living as you see fit, defining good and morality as you desire. You reject the submission to a God that would constrain your desires or even change them. It is likely your will that you reject God, not your mind. In closing, take the words of men, not religious, but far more articulate and communicating and smarter than I. Blaise Pascal, the 17th century mathematician, People, are almost in, people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive, followed up with a quote from a great, the great atheist, Frederick Nietzsche. If one were to prove this God of the Christians to us, we should be even less able to believe in him. Why is that true? Because it's not about proof. It's not even about faith. It's about submission. It's about submission to a God that would change your desires, that would demand you change your desires. How true is that for you? Because I, as I assess my own history, my own life, it is a history of rebellion and hatred toward God. Those words that were up there could not have been truer. But the good news for you, for me, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Is your freedom from submission, your unshackled desires and morality more compelling than the better king? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, Lord, humble us. Lord, we we all have hearts that long, that long for freedom, that long to be unsubmitted and unshackled. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room, whether they stand opposed to God or in submission to him. Lord Jesus, I pray that you grab a hold of those hearts. You transform the desires and the will And you give them faith in a Jesus to whom submitting is better than opposing. Lord, help us as Christians, even in our own temptation to define for ourselves who we want to be, define our own goods and moralities and purpose. Lord, let us be guided by your word and by truth, by who you are and what you've asked us to be. Lord Jesus, we love you. We need you. In your name we pray, amen.